Good morning. Could you turn, please, in your Bible to the uh, book of Ephesians in the New Testament, chapter 6? Ephesians chapter 6. <clears throat> I found that interesting. One of the announcements was a Father's Day photo op out in the courtyard. Now I know why all those uh, Chino Valley police officers with cameras are out there. They're looking for you, I think, maybe. <laughs> Do get pictures. The more pictures you have of your family, the better off everybody is. And always put the date and what it was. Because when you get older and you start looking at pictures and you say, who is that? What was that all about? It'll come in handy for somebody somewhere to know their family. We're very grateful for God and the concept of father, the concept of mother, the concept of family. There's not really a religion in the world anywhere that uses that concept that I know of. I got a master's degree years ago in world religions, and um, I just saw how the, the Bible, the God of the Bible, is the only one. He is God. He is the creator. But he made such a statement about his love for his creation. And you, there's only one of you. He thought you out. Jeremiah said, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you, and I ordained you a prophet unto the nations. And that means that you're unique. God thought you out. Now, somebody sitting next to you probably just elbowed you and say, yeah, I can say amen to that. You are a piece of work. <laughs> but you are special, and you don't hear that enough. And that you're tremendously loved by God. He's not a religion. He's real. And he's made himself known to you if you want to know him. And probably one of the most difficult assignments we get is to be a parent, a husband, a wife, a mother, a father, but to be a child too. And if you watch the Animal Channel, you'll see like this week they've run several times what's going on in the Antarctic. Um, polar bears are down in the snow underground in a pit that they dug to sleep in during the winter for four months and they give birth to their little babies and then the babies come out for the first time and um, how the babies learn by just watching the mama bear it's an amazing thing in the animal kingdom we have bird nests in the same place every year every spring for all different kinds of birds in our backyard and boy the mothers are they protective of those little babies once they're hatched even before they're hatched one year we had a red-tailed hawk come diving towards our dining room windows and made a quick turn, but he was after the mother bird that had a, a nest with three little babies just above our door. And she had picked that spot because it was a safety place. If ever there is a time for dads, I'm only going to speak for America, though I've traveled around the world a lot. I know a lot of the cultures. For our country, if ever there is a time for men to stand up and not only be a man, but to be a father, this is the time. We're on the way down and we're on the way out. And unless men will become men and get off this anti-masculine, fluffy mood that our country has put us in. Uh, and so when you think of a family, the mother, the father, the child, it's three in one. In the book of Acts, it says all flesh comes from one blood. No matter what color your skin is or what culture you're born from or into, we all go back to the blood that was in the veins of Adam. And it's wonderful when you stop and think of that. There is no such thing as racism because we all go to that one flesh. And when God designed us, he knew what he was doing. And so all of this propaganda that's out is all out to divide people. And a house divided cannot stand. And uh, we are a divided people right now. And the more people talk about the issues, the more they divide. And it's the enemy is inside our country that we're wrestling with right now. It's not missiles being fired. I was at lunch a few weeks ago with a friend who was a pilot in um, Vietnam in the conflict there. 
And he said, you know this Wuhan laboratory? And he said, oh yeah, up to date following that. I've been to Wuhan. And he said, well, when I was a pilot in uh, the Vietnamese war, we all had a second target other than what we're doing. If China came into the war in the 60s, my target was a laboratory, a military laboratory in a town called Wuhan. So that place has been a problem for a long, long time. We gave up a lot of freedoms and a lot of liberty in the last 12 months. But one of the greatest that the people gave up willingly and freely, according to the Barna Group, was in June, one year, 12 months ago, after four months of people knowing about COVID, six feet apart, and wearing a mask. They found that one out of every three Christians that were attending church regularly no longer attended their church nor watched the services online. So we lost one-third of Christianity because of a mask and a flu bug. What else is it going to take? Because we're told in the last days God's going to shake everything that can be shaken. And the Bible says in Revelation, woe in the last days. Woe to the inhabitants of earth. This is a global situation, not just a local situation. For Satan, that old serpent, the dragon of old, has been cast down to earth and he's full of wrath. And then it says in your Bible, because, comma, and I love it, it is said because, because that gives you why he's full of wrath. You know, you liked teachers like that, didn't you? I liked it when they say, this is going to be on the test on Friday. I always got one answer correct every Friday, because they said this is the answer to what's going to be on the test. Well, here's the answer to why he's so full of wrath at the end of the age. Because he knows that his time is short. You see, he was created in eternity, has lived in eternity, and now the clock is ticking against him, and he knows it. You were created in time, you've always been in time, and you're leaving the time zone, going to eternity. He hates human beings. He hates men. He hates fathers that are real godly men. He hates mothers. He hates marriage between a man and a woman because God created them male and female, created him as one man, one woman. And the two shall depart from their mother and father and a man shall cleave to his wife, and the two will become one. And through the love of a man and a woman comes the birth of a baby girl or baby boy. And you are made in the image and the likeness of God. So it's become very obvious that he knows his time is up, and so he's throwing everything he can at the image of God, which is a man and a woman. And he's got governments endorsing the lie then a man can think he's a woman and a woman can think she's a man and a man or a woman can think they're both or whatever and tarnish the image of God. This is a spiritual warfare. Our planet is infested with spirits and demons from hell and they are controlling the media worldwide right now, politic worldwide. And you need to realize that this Father's Day comes at a time when a national holiday just before Father's Day called Juneteenth was just passed. To always remind Americans what bad people they are, it's very subtle. We've given up a lot of freedom. We've let out a lot of weirdos tell us what we're going to be, what we're going to do, and not one of them has been voted in the office by the people. So men... It's time to stand up and be counted as a man, a God-fearing man, to stand for righteousness. Because if you don't stand for righteousness, you'll fall for everything. The word father itself is found 998 different times in the Bible, King James Version, 998. And the most places that it is found, the word father, is in the book of Genesis, 140 different times. It's found in many, many books. But I found that interesting that Genesis is the beginning and it uses the word father more than any other place in the Bible. All the way to the book of Revelation. It's just everywhere in the Bible. But the emphasis is so strong in the book of Revelation that we need to, I mean, excuse me, in Genesis, that we need to realize that God emphasizes 
this important role that a man has. Fathers are a specialty becoming a quick rarity. They're leaving their families behind. Fathers have special days. Mothers have special days. Back before the cell phone, some of you didn't live back then. We had covered wagons in those days when I was in school and uh, smoke signals. But then they came to the phone. And uh, depending on what your budget was, you might have had two or three, maybe four different people on your street had the same line you did, but a different number. And people could listen to what you're saying on your phone. The neighbors would pick it up. In the 1970s in Eastern Europe, when the communists were in charge, um, I remember one place in Poland where the uh, man said to me, now I'm gonna make a phone call, I want you to listen in. And he says, hello, Mrs. Jacobson. This is your neighbor across the street. I hear you listening in on my phone call right now. Because some people got free phones in Eastern Europe and Russia and places like that uh, by spying on their neighbors. So you would make a long distance call, it cost you nothing with a cell phone now, it's part of your deal. But in the olden days, you would dial operator and you'd say, I'd like to call Portland, Oregon. And so they'd charge that to your bill, but the operator made the call. And then there was what called a collect call. Let's say you're at school somewhere and you want to call your dad and wish him Happy Father's Day. You could call the operator and say, I'd like to call my father and his number's in uh, Chino and here's his telephone number and my name is, and you tell him your name, and I'd like this to be a collect call. What that means is that when your dad gets on the line, the operator will have to ask this question. Do you accept the charges? And they'd say yes. Well, that meant this telephone call, he would pay for it because you don't have any money. So he called, it's a collect call. Well, for years, AT&T was the only choice you had in the USA. And for years, Mother's Day had the most telephone calls ever in any year's period. Every Mother's Day, everybody is calling mom. Isn't that great? However, the dads couldn't be outdone, so um, they found out that every year, the most collect telephone calls came on Father's Day. And that's just how it is, I guess. There's a guy I read about the other day. His name was Frank Howard Clark. I have no idea who he is. He said, um, he's a, a father is someone who carries pictures where his money used to be. That says it a lot, I think, huh? So we have these four little verses. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Ephesians 6.1. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, that you may live long on the earth, and you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. I've done a lot of research over the years about the greatness of our country and how great world leaders way back in the 1700s had come to America. And de Tocqueville is one that comes to mind from France. The greatness of America is not in its banks or its navy or its wealth or its oars and uh, all the mineral rights they have. It's in the pulpits of their churches is where the strength of America and American people are. That couldn't be said today, but that's how we started as a people. It is so interesting to realize that's gone away. And when you think of that, the greatness came from the pulpits. And now an article was just released two days ago that there are people asking that the Congress of the United States would now take away all the rights that churches have and uh, their tax-free property and their money being used for charity because the Republican Party is basically Republicans that are Christians and they cause all the trouble. You see, the pulpit isn't used to preach politic because politic does nothing for anybody ultimately. And then you get divided because you're not this politic, but you're that politic, and those two fight. 
And it divides a nation, it divides a home. Yes, it is pre-Adolf Hitler years in our country. And we're seeing anti-Semitic things show up. We're seeing Christianity pushed out and down and debauchery being taught in our schools. And the things that are coming for California education are disgusting for the little children. It's just why the Lord is even waiting beyond today. I don't understand except his love is so great. And it might be because of you. And you need to give your heart to God today. Unless our families stand before God, there's no reason for us to be a people any longer. Because we used to be the number one missionary sending of the gospel in all the world. And now we no longer do that. It's a sad time for us. However, if the word father is that important to God, it should be important to us, very important to us. Joseph, when he was the prime minister of Egypt, was on the throne when his brothers came. You'll remember that in um, Genesis 42 and 43. The famine was all over the world, and Jacob said, go and buy grain in Egypt. And when Joseph saw his brothers come, I'm sure that he flashed back to that day they tried to murder him, and they put him in a pit. And then Reuben said, we can't kill him. But they sold him to some Midianite traders, some Ishmaelites, as they were coming with their caravans and going to Egypt. And though that was a horrible time, God was with that boy. He was 17 years old. And it says his dad said, go out and find out how the sheep are doing and how your brothers are doing. And when they saw him, said, here comes that little runt. Let's kill him. They hated him. They're jealous of him. And they went to a place as he wandered out. They went to Shechem. And there was a certain man that saw Joseph wandering. No purpose. It was a word that was used in the Old Testament language that would be a man that was uh, inebriated or drunk possibly. Not saying that he was drunk, but he was staggering around. He had no purpose. And he said, what is it you look for? And he said, I'm looking for my brothers and my father's sheep. And he said, oh, they've gone on to Dothan. There was a drought in Shechem. And it was a 12 to 14 mile walk from Shechem to Dothan. And when the son got there, Joseph, and they see him, one of them says, let's put him in a pit. Dothan happens to mean a place of two wells. They were there for the water, but one of them was completely dry. Maybe your well is dry. And we have no record of how God worked in this young boy's life, 17 years old, but he did something phenomenal, and there was an impact between the 17-year-old and God that's completely silenced. But when we see him grow up, we see the wisdom that God gave him, the bright mind that God gave him, the honorable spirit. And when these men come and say they want to buy, Joseph doesn't tell him, I'm your brother that you think is dead. He heard every word in the Hebrew language and they did not know that he understood Hebrew. They just thought he was an Egyptian. And they said, we are honest men. In uh, King James, I think the word is, uh, we're true men. We're, we're men of truth. You're murdering your brother and you can go around town for 20 years and saying you're honest? No way. But they even said in front of him, and it made him weep, this guy wants us to leave Simeon behind, go back and get Benjamin, which is his brother from his mother. The others were half-brothers. And he says to them, I think you're spies. You leave this man here and you go get your younger brother that you say you have and tell me about your father. They asked the question, is your father still alive? Is the old man still alive? He's basically saying, tell me about your father. So I'd like to say to all of us right now, tell me about your father. We have two fathers. We have an earthly father and we have a heavenly father. Now, maybe your earthly father abandoned you and your family. But yet, your heavenly father says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, but you've never endorsed him. You've never invited him into the heart, into your life. 
So one you know really well, and the other you're not too sure about, maybe. Billy Graham once said, a good father is one of the most unsung, unpraised, unnoticed, and yet one of the most valuable assets in our society. And that's true. It is difficult to be a father. In a godless generation, it is difficult to be a father. When the statistics tell us that men that are Christian are watching as much pornography as men that aren't, that men that are Christian divorce their wives and leave their children in almost the same numbers as those that aren't. At a time when the church is divided and the country is divided, there's one solution. That's God. And it's going to take men to stand up for righteousness and call upon the name of God to be able to see anything positive come because we're going into a spiral. I flew airplanes, jets, twin engines, seaplanes, land planes, uh, upside down planes and around planes and for years. And, uh, you know, you get two degrees off leaving from San Diego International Airport and you head towards Honolulu, just two degrees is off, that's all. You'll probably miss the entire Hawaiian Islands by the time you get 2,438 miles away from San Diego. And if your life as a man is just two degrees off and you start saying, well, it's legal, so I can do it. It's endorsed, they march in the streets. I can be whatever I want to be. That's the good doctrine of hell, isn't it? You can do whatever you want with no repercussions. And there is a judgment. And we will all give account of our lives. And so we have an issue about being a godly father or an ungodly father. Um, a lady named Emily, Emily, I forgot her last name. She works with uh, a think tank in Washington, D.C. called the Heritage Foundation. She wrote a really great article. I just want to give you a couple paragraphs from it, but you can do your own research on it, on uh, kids that are shooters, school shootings, and that type of thing. And there's some common denominators. In Proverbs chapter 17, verse 6, it says, Grandchildren are the crowning glory of the aged. Parents are the pride of the children. But do we see that respect in television? The sitcoms? Back in the 70s, it started that there were no more live audiences. And it dawned on me in the late 70s, early 80s, that all the funny shows had canned laughter. And America was being trained what to laugh at. A real audience would not laugh at what we laugh at. And so we've been brainwashed and, and our minds are just so polluted. We don't have freedom until you get into this book. Jesus said, you'll know the truth. I am the truth. And the truth shall make you free. And once you're free, he said, you are free indeed. Every area of your life, once you surrender. And Emily said, what lies inside so many school shooters is a deep void of identity and relationship that they tragically seek to fill through violence. There's a sobering theme repeated over and over in the biography of school shooters, the fatherlessness of a broken or never formed family. Now, I've been part of a special team of people that gets called to these kind of situations, these scenes from Ground Zero to Oklahoma City to Sandy Hook uh, to the Aurora Theater shooting. Uh, and I have some personal one-on-one -on -one reactions from people in these situations. So I know the pain and the suffering that comes to a community by it, but the repercussions go on, and it's always about gun control. It's never about heart control. Never about truth and freedom and liberty and justice and fear of God. It's always about control those guns. No. There are many of you here. Well, I don't want to say that because you may want to check everybody's license or something. But, you know, I grew up as a boy in Oregon. Everybody had a gun. I had a brother, uh, an uncle who is a police officer, two of them. And he pulled over a man on the coast 
they both uh, were juvenile delinquents, my uncles, and uh, the judge one time said, you're both going to the Marine Corps or you're going to jail. They went to the Marine Corps. They came back and finished 30 plus years as Oregon State Patrol officers. The Marines just shaped them up. But he made a mistake. He pulls this man over. His brake lights weren't working. He said, give him the fix-it ticket. And as he walks up, he sees the man, gets his stuff. He's writing it down. Says, just get it fixed. Have an officer sign it off. Walks back to his car. The dispatch says, the driver's license belongs to a man that 911 is on the phone right now with his wife, and he's on his way to murder her at her house. And so Uncle Gene said, in my mind's eye, I saw that rifle in the rack in the back of his pickup window. Everybody has rifles in the back of their pickup window in Oregon. It's just part of the culture. And this is the danger, isn't it? You let culture direct your life instead of the Holy Spirit, you're blinded. And your mind is foggy. Oh, it's okay. It's legal in California to roll your own and to puff them all you want. But is it right? It's legal to do whatever you want. But is it right? You see, speaking to fathers and sons, you obey your parents because this is right. It's a just cause. Among 25 of the most cited school shooters since Columbine, Colorado, 75% of the shooters were reared in broken homes. Psychologist Dr. Peter Langman, a preeminent expert on school shooters, found that most came from incredibly broken homes, of not just divorce and separation. If you've been through that as a child, you know how painful that is. But also of infidelity, substance abuse, criminal behavior, domestic violence, and child abuse. And after the Sandy Hook Elementary School massacre, and I happened to be there for a week or more, I believe, and uh, it was an ugly scene. The scholar Brad Wilcox called attention to the work of criminologists Michael Gottsfredson and Travis Hershey, which found the absence of fathers to be one of the most, quote-unquote, powerful predictors of crimes, fatherless criminals. He explained that fathers are role models. They're sons who maintain authority and they're role models in discipline, thereby helping them develop self-control and empathy towards other people, key character traits lacking in violent youth. Now, my stepdad and my mother divorced after I'd spent several years in foster care. I became very bitter, very angry as a little boy growing up, you know, as somebody else trying to be my parents. And then she remarried. So my dad was an alcoholic, never knew him. I led him to the Lord at 82. He died at 83. I asked him to forgive me because I wanted to kill him a few times as a boy um, because of the life that we lived. And I went to beat him up one time at 16. And I, my plan was he'll come to the door, I'll reach through the screen, and I'll pull him out, throw him down, and I'll just beat him so badly he won't even be able to get up. But when I saw him for the first time, maybe I saw him twice in my life before that, he never paid child support. We were always kicked out of apartments. Sometimes we didn't have dinner or a telephone or the lights were shut off. And I had all this built up inside of me, and he was a monster, this dad that didn't look after his kids. And when he came to the door and I started to go, I realized this guy is nothing but a skinny little drunk. Well, it hurt him pretty bad. I'll leave him alone. I said, get your checkbook out. You haven't paid any money for a long time and we have no place to live. And he did. Now, my stepdad, he calls my brother. My brother calls me and He's had a stroke, and he's up in Oregon, and he's going to die. He needs to talk to you. Okay. So I call him. I just have to say that I feel really ashamed of how I disciplined you. I said, what? You know, when you went to that foster thing, I know that hurt your life. I said, yes. He said, that was my doing. That wasn't your mother's. No, that was my doing. And I think I over-disciplined you and made you an angry young man. And I want to tell you I'm sorry. I said, you over-disciplined me? 
And then I thought, this man is going to die, and he wants to clear the slate. Wow, what a time to evangelize him. Hang him over hell a little bit and say, you don't over-discipline the boys. <laughs> so I said, hold it, Ozzy. Um, uh, you don't know how I grew up once I got out of high school, but I was a bad person. And I was a violent person as a boy in school. And um, you went to our sporting events, but I just had so much anger. I deserved every bit of discipline you tried to give me. I don't remember you doing that. I've always liked you. And you see, this is the thing about dads. We're misunderstood sometimes. We try to love you as our children and, and to be a good dad to you, but you don't know all the facts. You were 10 or 11 at the time. You didn't understand the pressure that we were under as a dad. So if you're sitting here holding bitterness against your dad, give it to your heavenly dad and let him just free you. And you men that feel failures, because I said to my alcoholic real father, I was speaking at the Portland Coliseum, and uh, I went to see him, and he was sick, in bed. And I sat on the floor across from his bed. I hadn't seen him for maybe 10, 15 years. And uh, I said, I want to ask you just one question. I don't want you to feel bad. I just want an honest answer. You ever once in your entire life as an alcoholic ever feel bad that you never told me or my brother that you loved us? You've never once hugged us? You didn't think of us at Christmas or our birthdays? Did you ever feel guilty that you never came to a football game, a wrestling match, or a track meet? And both of us were really good athletes, especially my brother. He was city champion in everything that he did. Do you ever feel guilty about that? You know, a boy on a football field, on a track, he wants to see his dad proud of him. He started to cry. He was 80 years old. He turned his head to the wall, and just before he turned to the wall, he said, every time, Michael, I put the bottle to my lips, I have felt guilty your entire life. Wow. I didn't ever expect to hear that before this old guy died. And the Lord gave me grace. I said, you know what, Dad? I'm more of a bad guy than you. And uh, I've hurt more lives than you. And I forgive you because God forgave me. And his, died, his son actually died for me. And Dad, he died for you too. All those years of loneliness of you, not making it as a father and a husband, more than one marriage, more than two families. I forgive you because Jesus forgives. Men, that's the greatest words that we can be forgiven. And we don't know how to be the best, but God does. After Sandy Hook Elementary School Massacre, there was a scholar who took these two guys and, uh, and, and took their work and made it ready that men are role models for their society, for their family and home. The late rapper Tupac Shakur said, I know for a fact that had I had a father, I'd have some discipline in my life. I'd have more confidence. Your mother can't calm you down the way a man can. You need a man to teach you how to be a man. And Tupac, who was murdered in 1996, started hanging out with gangs because he wanted to belong to a family. A profound source of identity is a family. And we are half of our mother and half of our father, and when a father abandons a child, they don't feel that they have that. And so here we are in a society where the family, since the last 40 years, has been pushed aside, looked down upon. When I was... Uh, going to date somebody at a college, you didn't get into the girl's dorm, let alone live with your girlfriend in a dorm. They had dorm mothers that were worse than drill instructors in the Marine Corps. You didn't get past those stairs or up to the next floor. No way. But when all morals were broken down and endorsed by the government, 
our families fell apart. And we're paying the price now. And to those of you that are younger, if Jesus doesn't come back soon, our generation owes you a huge apology that we gave God up to have the pleasures of sin. You know, the father in Sandy Hook, I, I know this family, I resourced them a lot. I got to know the members of that small community. Adam Lanza, the Sandy Hook shooter, had not seen, uh, he's the father of the shooter, had not seen his son in two years. And later, after the shooting, he told reporters he wished that boy had never been born. Yes. Wow. The father of Nicholas Cruz died when Cruz was five years old. The other shooter, the father of six-year-old Dedrick Owens, the country's youngest school shooter, was in jail, the father, when his son killed his first grade classmate. Dedrick Owens' father has said that he suspects his son's crime was a reaction to his absence. Wow. In 1965, Senator Daniel Moynihan did a research on our families falling apart in the 60s, and he found that fatherlessness would lead to a poor outcome for African-American children. And it was published at a time when only 25% of African-American households were led by a single parent. 25% in 1965. Today, 24% of white non-Hispanic families are headed by a single parent, and the rate has reached in the African-Americans is 66% are fatherless. And you wonder why every weekend, every month, hundreds are being murdered in Chicago. And you find out the zip codes and what is there. And you see the fatherless, the fatherless. It's an honor to be a father. I never thought I could be. Sandy and I were married. She was pregnant with our second child when we got divorced. And uh, when we came back together and decided I became a Christian, she saw as a changed man, definitely a changed man. My mother saw it. She said, you're not my son anymore, are you? I said, no, I'm not that one that you tried to help. She became a Christian at 60. Her mom and dad became Christians, giving their heart when they saw her, their daughter, who really didn't have much to change from, but just she saw Jesus, and he became number one in her life, and I saw Jesus, and we were remarried. But one morning, a week before our second marriage, I was sitting on the edge of the bed with my Bible, and I was reading my devotion, and I started to cry, and I'm not a crybaby. It's hard to get me to cry. And... Um, I'm crying. And I said, God, you got to help me. I don't know how to be a father to David and Mindy, our first daughter and first son. I now have six children. One was from high school that we found several years ago. And Sandy and I have five. And uh, as I was saying, I don't know how to be a father. And I heard a small, still voice. It said, Michael. And only my mother called me Michael and Sandy called me Michael. It usually meant I was in trouble. Everybody else calls me Mike. So when I hear Michael, I know, ah, this is an official meeting or something's going on here, right? So I hear Michael, I will be your role model. Let God be your role model as a daddy. And what an honor to be called daddy. Wow. You have an earthly father, you have a heavenly father. Which one do you know the best? Will you tell me about your father? Which one do you know least? Would you tell me about that father? I've been met, honored many, many times around the world, honestly, in the name of Jesus, from the key to the Manila, Philippines, to a gold badge service at New York City during 9-11 with the commissioner and the chief sitting right there. I couldn't believe this was happening and, you know, placards and all sorts of things. But there's no greater honor that I've had as a man than to be the father of Sandy's five babies and to know him 
and to love them and to look to God as they were little. When my daughter Mindy saw me, she hadn't seen me for two years. When I walked up, she was standing on the other side of the screen door. It was my birthday, and Sandy called and said, would you like to have cake and ice cream with your children? I said, yeah. Two years I hadn't seen that little girl. And when I walked up, she screamed out to her mother, it's my daddy. She was only three or four years old. That image of a daddy was in her heart. All that time I was out being an idiot. And that little girl is married to a pastor and loves Jesus like nobody loves Jesus and is a solid follower of the Lord. To be a dad. It starts out daddy. And then they get a little older. Hey, dad. And then, hey, pop, you got 20 bucks? It just moves on. Pastor, author Chuck Swindoll tells us of his father. Sometimes, quote, I wake up before dawn and I love sitting up in the middle of the bed with all the lights off, pitch black, dark, talking to the Father with no interruptions, nothing that reminds me that anything in life exists but for me and my Father. Let God be number one in your life. You'll be the best dad in the neighborhood. Be easy on yourselves. Don't beat yourselves up with your failures. Let God strengthen you. Because God is love and he's a father. And he who fears is not made perfect in God's love. It's easy to fear being a father. It's such responsibility. And to see them leave and make choices that weren't the best. You don't beat them up for that. You love them. And you're patient with them. And you're kind with them. Chase, our 18-year-old grandson, one of our many grandsons, died just 23rd of January this year. Toxology report said there was enough fentanyl in one pill that he took that could have killed nine men. This morning in Phoenix, our daughter was on television. She's helping now be a spokesperson. All over the Phoenix area, teenagers are dropping dead because of fentanyl. Thousands across the country every month. On my phone, I have a text. A week before Chase died, it was just me, his papa, his grandpa. Chase, I love you. I'll always love you. I'm always here to help you. I'll do anything. Just let me know. I'm here for you. I'm not going to erase that because there's other people in my life I need to remind I love them. In dads, it's hard to say I love you maybe, but it's a memory they'll never forget. And you're an honored people because you have a pastor that every time he has spoken to me about his father and his mother, it's with great honor. And to have a shepherd who believes this is true is a blessing to you because he knows God honors those that honor their parents. In Proverbs 20, verse 7, it says that a righteous man, the godly man, walks in his integrity, and blessed are their children who follow. Be a godly dad. Mark Twain said, if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. Just be honest with yourself before God. Yes, he addressed it to children. Obey your parents. He shows your duty and responsibility. Obey. That word obey means to listen attentively to submit to and be obedient unto me, unto them. Tell me about your father. Can you say yes to all of that? Obey. And that word obey, in Matthew 8, 27, it says the men marveled, saying, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? The same word for you and me, 
to obey our fathers. What type of a human man is this? He can walk on water. Men can't do that. What type of a father is this? He's at every game. He's everywhere with his daughters. They know what a godly man will look like and what the rest of the buffoons look like by knowing what a non-godly man means. And why? You do this because it's right. And that word right means observing divine and human laws. And in Matthew 1.19, speaking of Mary, pregnant by the Holy Spirit, it says, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, right, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. See, the law said, bad girl, bring her to the city center and let them stone her to death. But God's love and the love of a husband who fears God says, I'm not going to embarrass you. It's very difficult for me, Mary. Uh, it's just hard to believe you're pregnant and we've never had sex, but <laughs> you're telling me God is the father here, but I'm going to do what's right. And what's right is you need to have this baby and let this baby live. And who would have thought that John the Baptist was in her aunt's womb and when they met, that baby John leapt in her womb and she felt it. No, fathers, if anybody should be gentle and kind and forgiving, it should be us and understanding because there's many things our kids will never know about us when we were younger and we need to be patient in love. Tell me about your father. And verse 2 and 3, honor them. And that means to set or fix a value upon. Venerate them, revere them. And why? It's the first promise in Scripture that you'll live a long and a happy, good life. You want to be right with God? Then you'll be right with everyone else. So in closing, it's a two-way street. We can't bully children because in that fourth verse, it says fathers. No, he's directing it to the dads. Do not provoke your children to wrath. Bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. Yes, I can tell you about my father. My earthly father can't tell you too much. But I do know he prayed two different times with me to accept Jesus before he died. And he called me to verify that. And the cancer had him so badly that I could barely hear what he was saying. And I said, Jesus is who you want to follow. And he says, I know. I've asked him to lead me. It's never too late. And it's never too late for children to forgive their fathers. Joy was born when I was 17. Her uh, mom was uh, in college. I was still in high school. And when I found her, first night Sandy and I dated, I told her about this baby. I said, you probably wouldn't like to be around a guy like me. I have an illegitimate baby, and I don't know anything about the baby. She was adopted. And uh, she said, you should find that baby. Well, we found her a few years back. And at that time, she had two daughters. Today, she has four. They're the most gorgeous women, those granddaughters. Amazing. And one of them has four of my great-grandsons and daughters. And so I, I said to Joy before I was going to leave, I said, can I go in and pray for your daughters? Yes, of course. She's a Christian. And I went in, and Tara was laying there, and she was five, and uh, Whitney was there. She was three, two and a half, three years old. And there was a praise album on a cassette player next to their bed. And I happened to help produce that album, and I was singing along with it with them. And so I knelt down, and I said, um, you know, with all my boys and girls at night when I'm home, I put my hand on their forehead, and I pray for them that God would bless my children. Now they're all growing up. So I'd like to bless you, my granddaughters. And so I knelt down and put my hand on Whitney's forehead. She's like 26, 25 right now and just has the most beautiful baby and she wasn't able to have babies and God gave her a beautiful Josephine. 
And she said, what do you think you are doing? And I said, well, I'm going to bless you. Go to your own house and bless yourself. That was at three years old. She's still the same at 23 years old, but it's all right. It's, it's all good. So go to your homes and bless one another. Fathers, it's a great honor that you have, that you have children. And if you've slumped on the job a little bit, just ask God's forgiveness. He'll heal their hearts. He'll heal your heart. If you're doing all you can, God bless you. Don't ever give up on them because their needs get greater as they get older and they still need daddy.